six as STP four is coming in. We um, are waiting for more of the committee to show up, so we will give it a couple more minutes. We will officially start. Lynette, it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to hear you. Is this better? Yes. Thank you. Oh, Sorry. Perfect. Good afternoon. I'm waiting to see if a couple more committee members are going to hop on here and we will start in the next minute or so. Okay, happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the Mental Health Parity Advisory Committee meeting, October 22nd, 2021. Um, I am going to start with roll call and introductions. I thank everybody for coming. Um, Angela Gamboa. Carly Fleege. Here. David Carnahan. Dr. Don Fowles. Here, hey, Lynette. Good afternoon. Um, 
Elizabeth Paz is unable to join us today. Uh, Carrie Steving. Good morning, here. Thank you. Kathy Busby. Here. Hi, Monica Curry. Good afternoon, here. Good afternoon. Dr. Rogers Wilson. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Vista Thompson. And we have a new member. I don't know if she has joined yet. Um, I will introduce her and then if she hops in, we'll come back and she can say some words as well. Um, we had a family member of the committee that had some other commitments and had to resign her post. And so we have a new family member. Her name is Nicole Porter and I see that she has joined. Um, Nicole Porter um, has been in this community in various uh, functions um, in the industry of behavioral health as well as a family member. And so, Nicole, I don't know if you want to say anything else, say hi to the committee. We are so excited to have her. She's gonna bring such a wealth of information and knowledge. She served on the mental health committee, mental health parity committee in Texas um, prior to um, relocating back to Arizona. So we're excited to have her input, Nicole. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for letting me join your team. I'm really excited to work with y'all. We're excited to have you. And I apologize for the barking dog, everybody. Okay. As we move forward on the agenda, um, DiFi did a website migration um, recently. It was a huge undertaking, so um, I just want to congratulate the our IT team behind the scenes that did this massive migration and merging of multiple websites into one. So the the mental health parity website is there. Um, you have to go through through some different steps there, but everything is functioning. So if you were having trouble trying to access it over the last few weeks, um, that was probably because it was due to the migration. But everything is up and running now. Um, if you have any questions or concerns. Um, just uh, shoot me an email and let me know. And we've made some hopefully final edits to the community brochure. I don't know if, um, Mary, if you have that to show. We will also have a link to the brochure on the um, website. So for those of you that want to download it and share it, we, we want you to. It'll be a link there on the website and I will also send it out um, via email. Um, to committee members and share it. So you can um, share it, print it, um, so the word gets out. So here's what the first page looks like. Um, and we took everyone's, I know there was a lot of debate over some wording about comparable and, and things like that. So we've wordsmithed it to be as understanding as possible because we know that MAPIA can be very dense and, and complicated. And then if you go to the second page, Mary, we've put some resources on the back um, so people can find assistance through crisis lines, suicide hotlines, and things like that. So you definitely want it to be a functional document that's giving information, but also providing resources to point them in the right direction if they are in crisis or need um, immediate assistance. So I don't know if there's any questions about the brochure. Um, I will, like I said, I will, there will be a link on the web page um, that will be downloadable, and I will also send it out via email. Any questions, comment? I think everyone's input on this so we can get this out to our rural areas. I have a quick question, Dr. Hennigan. I know yes. I must be very behind, and I'm sorry <laughs> for asking probably redundant questions. That's um, okay. But is there a resource like the Department of Insurance or something similar, maybe an ombudsman or something that patients can call if they feel like they've had a parity violation? So there, there is, they can call, um, we have a, a line and an email address, um, appeals or complaints. And then if they call DIFI directly, there is someone there that can sift through that and they, they get it to the right department. Um, it's not, Mary, go back up to page one. I think it's on page one under a, appeal or complaints. There's information there 
Um, and it also talks about, I know one of the bigger issues is about if they, if they're inpatient and they have that using the ombudsman for the inpatient or the patient advocate there and still getting um, the information that they need. I hope that answers. It does. Awesome. I love that you guys put Jake's law on here too. How cool. I had just a little bit of question about the appeal or complaint language. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, if a person has an unsuccessful appeal, would that not give them an option then to reach out to the department to file a complaint? Um, Lynette, I can take this one if you'd like. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Carly. Um, uh, so the healthcare appeals process is is um, set forth in statute, and there are three levels of appeal. The first two, well, <laughs> there's there's two levels of appeal in some cases. So, but but there are multiple levels of appeal. The final level of appeal is to the department. It's an external review, uh, and uh, if the um, uh, patient is not um, uh, that doesn't doesn't win that appeal at the external review. They can actually um, seek a review of that uh, at a hearing, and they can ultimately go to superior court. So, um, but the department is not a party to either of those uh, uh, events if the if it if it uh, once our external review process is completed. Um, but so there are a couple of additional steps and there is information on the department's website regarding all of those appeal rights. Uh, so, so, no, the appeals process is distinct from the consumer complaint process. And we don't, we don't, if something has been reviewed by the appeals process, it, it's, it's, it's not appropriate for it to come back in as a complaint. So, I mean, I don't want to be really nitpicky, but. I feel like as a consumer, I may look at this and say, okay, well, I appealed the insurance decision through the insurer's internal process. I guess that's the final word. Is there any possible way that the language on there can be tweaked so that they know there is an additional step or two that they can take if they are not successful from an internal Review perspective that well, that that information is on our website. I think we were trying to be um, judicious I, I with space. Pardon? Yeah, concise. I understand yeah. the space limitation. But if if there is if if there is you know some you know brief additional comment that you would suggest that we put in here to make that clear, um, you know, we'd be happy to consider that. Uh, but that but that's the. the the importance of um, this information, this, this is something that's been stressed all along is that consumers don't really know when to appeal something versus when to file a complaint. Sure. And so the hope here was to make it clear that there are two distinct processes and that there are times when you do one and there are times when you do another, uh, do the other. Uh, and so if, if you don't think we've quite captured that somehow, uh, we definitely wanna know that. I don't know. I was thinking like including, you know, a secondary or external appeal through this other process that's not internal. Because I just think like a lot of people think, okay, well, the insurance company said no again, and I guess that's the final word. And I'm afraid that this maybe is not quite clear enough that there are additional steps that can possibly be taken. So even the external review process, uh, and, and this is on our website, but even the extra, so again, there are multiple steps of appeal and that third final step of appeal, you still initiate that through your insurer, but uh, it ultimately, that external review is done by the Department of Insurance and Financial Institutions. So the external review is us. Uh, your, your first level of review is at the insurer, if you continue the appeal, the next level of review is external by the department. Uh, and then if you're still not satisfied with the outcome of that, then you can go outside the department to um, Office of Administrative Hearings and ultimately to Superior Court. Um, again, that's a lot of information, which is why we were really just trying to get people directed towards 
the information uh, on our website, but I think maybe we want, perhaps we want to include um, some statement here under this, the, the, the paragraph that says, generally speaking, if an insurance company denies, maybe at the conclusion of that paragraph, Carly, we want to add something that says, um, you know, for more detailed information on your appeal rights visit and, and then give them our website. Do you think that would help? Might help, yeah. Um, I think we can, in Kaczynski, is that what you were proposing? I think so in the slides. Yeah. I think too, Carly, this was going to work in tandem as this goes out, as I start going out into the community and doing some speaking engagements and talking, can explain those steps as well um, as we hand out the brochure. So, as, so people will have a hard copy of foundational information, but they'll also have me as a speaker saying, and here's some next steps and here, you know, it won't just be the end all. It wasn't just, this wasn't just designed just to be the one-sided pamphlet without additional support. That helps too. But we can definitely make it clear at mm -hmm. a sentence that says, for more information on your appeal rights and how to file a complaint, visit, uh, you know, visit the department's website. I just know many of the folks here like work in the system, whether that's on the insurance side or as a provider. And so I, I know I'm not sure if everybody thinks in terms of a person who's never navigated the system before. And that's my biggest yeah. concern is that, you know, when a person is unhappy with the decision that their insurance company has made. There's a lot of emotion and a lot of frustration and stress. And usually, especially when we're talking about <clears throat> mental health benefits, there can be, you know, folks who are truly in crisis. And so just, I feel like people get to a hopeless place very quickly and so if they've gone through their insurance company's appeals process and they still are denied for medical necessity, I just wanna make sure that there's just enough information that people feel they can move to that next step, if, if any of that makes sense. Absolutely. I, I So I'm, I can see the language, I pulled the document up, so I've got it bigger now. Um, so there, the last paragraph here says, for instructions on how to appeal, contact customer service on the back of your insurance card. And the reason that we directed consumers there was because you initiate an appeal through your insurer. Um, but, but, but I think we could definitely augment that sentence to make it clear that to initiate an appeal, contact your insurer, but for more information on your appeal rights, come to us. Yeah, um, so they, so they know that there is a, a um, and, and maybe in the brochure, if it's even important. possible, you can say your appeal rights don't end with your insurer. Uh, For more information, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. We can definitely go back and work on that. If I could interject, this is Audrey Franklin and I'm the supervisor for healthcare appeals. I just wanted to point out too that anytime there is a denial, the law requires that people are given appeal rights. So they need to be given the next level right then and there at the time of the denial on how they can proceed further. And there's also an expedited process so that they have to make a decision within 72 hours. If it's a coverage issue, um, the department makes the decision whether it's covered in the policy, if it's medical necessity, we send it out for physician review. And, and I appreciate that, understand, don't disagree. I think having heard Jake's story from Denise countless times now, I think, <clears throat> and what I've advocated from the beginning is just a lot of extra handholding because when Jake was in crisis, you know, they got a giant packet of appeals information, but, you know, it was just such an overwhelming experience and they ultimately couldn't get 
a different answer before they had to pull Jake out of the hospital. Um, so again, I, I'm just advocating for as much hand holding as possible, you know, because we are talking about people who don't navigate these systems all the time and, and may not be familiar with the language and um, and are in a in a position of crisis and overwhelm. So They're vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. That was completely so, understandable. And and we want it we want it to be as navigatable as possible. So that's great feedback. Thanks guys. I appreciate and, it. And Thank I would you. hope that the providers would help as well. I would say probably ninety percent of the appeals that we receive are from a provider on behalf of an enrollee. So there's a, a great role that providers can play to, to help them navigate. Absolutely. And those providers are also, you know, constantly churning through those decisions as well. And it's a huge administrative burden on them and their staff. And so, again, just trying to make sure people have that handholding, whether it's at this sort of educational level or, you know, in the midst of crisis. And I'm here as, you know, a person who mm -hmm. has family uh, who died by suicide. And so I'm just trying to take it from the perspective of family members who are trying to navigate a system that is complex as I think everyone agrees. So thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Again, I don't want to belabor anything. <laughs> no, this is a very this is... important feedback. Yeah, sorry, Lynette. No, we, we definitely want the feedback because we want it to be a functional, meaningful document, not just something that we're just pushing out, but we want it to be meaningful. So that feedback is very helpful. Thank you. Anyone else? This is Nicole. Um, I just wanted to add that um, it's not just about the handholding, but um, the power in having the Department of Insurance involved in the appeal process once the insurance company has um, denied is, you know, we found in Texas that that was very powerful and it was it was almost like assigning the authority to the patient because the minute that these insurance companies got the call from in this case, it was TDI, Texas Department of Insurance. Um, they would immediately reverse their decision and allow the patient care. And so not that we want to use that power all the time, but um, it does seem to sway the decisions of the insurance companies when they know someone's looking. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Anyone else? Okay, we will take that back to the drawing board and at our next meeting, we'll have some, hopefully some updates on the, the brochure and it will be, be ready for distribution. Um, we don't have an update at this time on the suicide mortality program. So hopefully we'll have something at our next meeting on that. Next we have um, the MAPIA presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Erin um, to introduce our presenter. So, uh, you may remember at the last meeting, um, there was some pretty good discussion about um, what to, I think it came from reviewing the, the brochure. In fact, when we were talking about what is parity and what is comparable. Um, and we, we actually kind of started touching on the fact that MAPIA, um, there's some really complex tests that are involved in determining whether an insurer is compliant with MAPIA uh, and whether or not the way that their plan has been set up and the way that they're uh, um, operating is compliant with MAPIA. Um, and so to, to try to help clarify um, what what parity really means and how the department looks at parity and how the federal law treats parity. Um, we asked uh, Mary Boatwright to make a presentation to the committee members 
this is this is a, a, a version of a, a presentation that we've given internally to staff and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, others to to try to help everybody understand uh, what it means. I, I believe Mary is going to uh, kind of start with a really high level overview and then she's going to kind of dive deeper and deeper. Uh, I know our present. I, I've seen the presentation. It's it's wonderful in my opinion. But um, she is she, by the end of this, she's going to be giving you some really explicit examples of the way this test works, the parity test works. Uh, and so I, I think uh, I'm going to let Mary explain kind of the flow of the presentation because I think uh, and and kind of how we hope to uh, give you the opportunity to give comments here so we can make this the most effective possible. So, Mary Boatwright. Thank you, Erin. All right. Um, so, like Erin said, this, this presentation is intended to provide both a high level overview of the substantially all predominant test and give a detailed example of how the test works. This is not intended to teach you how to apply the test yourself. Um, as you'll see, Detailed projected claims data available only to the health plan is required to do this test. Uh, so our primary objective is to allow you to see the test in action and demonstrate that in application, the test is not always going to guarantee the outcome that you might expect. The presentation is going to take a little more than 15 minutes, um, but we think that questions you have early on may be answered in later slides. So I'm going to ask that you either put your questions into chat or hold your questions until the end of the presentation and just make a note of the slide number if there's one you want us to go back to. Dr. Hennigan will be monitoring the chat during the presentation and if there are any questions remaining when we come to the end, we'll circle back to them then. Some of the misunderstandings about what MAPIA does and does not require come back to this test. There's a disconnect between what the test requires and what it's perceived to require. In particular, we sometimes hear that, that, quote, a health plan can't require a consumer to pay more for mental health services. But that is not really what the test does. This presentation will identify the parts of a health plan to which the test applies and what the test does and doesn't require. And then last, we'll look at an example applying the test to a fictional health plan. So what does the substantially all predominant test cover? Or in other words, to what aspects of a health plan's benefits does the test apply? This test compares the financial requirements and quantitative treatment limits or QTLs that apply to MHSUD benefits within a classification to the financial requirements and QTLs that apply to med surge benefits within the same classification. Let's first take a brief look at the vocabulary here. Financial requirements are deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, and MOOPs, or out-of-pocket maximums. QTLs are numerical limits on coverage, such as day or visit limits. And continuing with vocabulary, what are classifications? Well, MAPIA provides six different classifications. Inpatient, in and out of network. Outpatient, in and out of network emergency care, and prescription drug. Subdivision of some of these classifications is permitted when evaluating compliance using the substantially all predominant test. Most notably for purposes of the test, MAPIA allows plans to subdivide outpatient services into office visits and all other outpatient items and services. This means that when applying MAPIA, plans are permitted to test these subdivisions separately. And we'll see an illustration of this when we step through our detailed example at the end of the presentation. So first, what does a substantially all predominant test require and what does it not require? And we'll start with what it does require. Let's look at this statement of the test. The financial requirements and QTLs that apply to MHSUD benefits within a classification must be no more restrictive than the predominant financial requirements or QTLs that apply to substantially all med surge benefits within that same classification. As defined by MAPIA, predominant means more than one half based on expected annual plan payments. 
and substantially all means at least two thirds based on expected annual plan payments. We'll break the test down to look at the two parts in more detail in a few slides, but now that we've seen what it does require, let's look at what it doesn't require. This slide brings us back to one of the common misunderstandings that we hear about MAPIA, the notion that a health plan can't require a consumer to pay more for mental health services. Does the test prevent plans from requiring a greater copay or coinsurance for any MHSUD benefit than for any med surge benefits? No, it doesn't. The test is used to determine the maximum MHSUD cost share which is the maximum copay or coinsurance that an insurer may apply to MHSUD benefits. But the cost share for some med surge benefits may still be lower than the maximum MHSUD cost share that is established by this test. And we're gonna be illustrating this with our example at the end of the presentation. Now let's take a closer look at the test itself. Here again, we have a statement of the test and I'm gonna read it at you one more time. And this is the last time I promise. The financial requirements and QTLs that apply to MHSUD benefits within a classification must be no more restrictive than the predominant financial requirements or QTLs that apply to substantially all med surge benefits within that same classification. It can be a lot easier to understand by looking at the two parts of the test one at a time. Before we look at the application of the two parts, let's just take a step back a moment to examine their functions. Functionally, step one determines if a financial requirement or QTL can even be applied to MHSUD benefits within classification. If we get past step one to step two, that is where we determine how much coinsurance, copay, et cetera, can be applied to MHSUD benefits within a classification. And let me just repeat that. So first we determine if a financial requirement or QTL can even be applied to MHSUD. And if it can, then we determine what level can be applied to MHSUD. So now that we know the function that each step performs, let's look at the technical requirements of each step. Step one is the substantially all portion of the test. Determine if the financial requirement or QTL applies to substantially all med surge benefits in the classification. Recalling the definition of substantially all, this means that we ask if a particular financial requirement or QTL applies to at least two thirds of the med surge benefits in that classification. If we find that some requirement does apply to at least two thirds of the med surge benefits, we move on to step two. But if not, then that particular financial requirement or QTL cannot apply to MHSUD benefits in that classification. And you'll see an illustration of this in our example in a little while. If we do make it to step two, it's time to identify the predominant level of financial requirement or QTL. Recalling the definition, this means we are determining the level of financial requirement or QTL that applies to more than half of the med surge benefits that are subject to the financial requirement or QTL. The financial requirement or QTL that applies to MHSUD benefits in the same classification cannot be more restrictive than this predominant level. Now, if the details of the test are still a little fuzzy, our example scenario applying the test may help. And we're gonna jump right into that example of the test. We've created a fictional list of covered benefits and projected claims percentages to illustrate the application of the test in one classification. In this example, we're testing financial requirements. So I'm going to start to read past mention of QTLs, but you know that it also applies to QTLs. We start with step one, determining whether the financial requirements apply to at least two thirds of the med surge benefits in a classification. First, our fictional health plan determines which classification they are testing. In this case, we're gonna test outpatient in network services. And to illustrate a subclassification, we are testing the all other items and services category, which is everything except for office visits. Next, the plan identifies the benefits in the outpatient all other classification and the type of 
financial requirement that applies to each benefit. You can see our list of benefits here, lab, x-ray, outpatient, preventative, etc. For most of them, the deductible applies, then the member pays coinsurance. But for outpatient preventative services, the plan pays 100%, and for other facility charges, the member pays a copay. Next, the plan projects the percentage of expected plan costs for each benefit. You can see that in this column that's circled in red. In this example, the plan expects for 10.2% of its total costs in this classification to be paid toward labs. And you can see the expected plan costs for the other outpatient, all other benefits listed in this green column. Then the plan identifies the level of financial requirement that applies to each benefit. This appears in the orange columns, also circled in red. Here we see that while the deductible applies to all of these benefits that require coinsurance, the level of coinsurance varies by benefit. Note the percentages at the bottom of each financial requirement column. This displays the total percentage of expected plan costs for benefits for which the financial requirement applies. More on that in the next two slides. Let's look at copay first. We see that measured by expected plan costs, only 8% of med surge benefits in this classification utilize a copay. 8% is less than two thirds, so the plan may not apply a copay to MHSUD benefits in this classification. Next, let's look at coinsurance and deductible. Measured by expected plan costs, the deductible and coinsurance apply to 90.4% of med surge benefits in this classification. This is more than two-thirds, so the plan is allowed to apply deductible and coinsurance to MHSUD benefits in this classification, and we get to move on to step two. But before we move on, let's look back at what we just accomplished in step one. Remember that the function of step one is to determine if a financial requirement or QTL can be applied to MHSUD benefits within the classification. In our example, the plan determined that the deductible and coinsurance applied to more than two thirds of MedSurge benefits, but copays applied to less than two thirds of MedSurge benefits. So the deductible and coinsurance can apply to MHSUD, but copays may not. Now recall the function of step two. Step two determines the level of financial requirement that can be applied to MHSUD benefits within the classification. Well, deductible does not vary by benefit, so there's not gonna be a predominant level of deductible, but the plan must now determine what level of coinsurance may apply to MHSUD benefits in the classification. We're delving into step two now, but I just want to, you to note the underlined language here. We are determining the level of financial requirement that applies to more than half of the MedSurge benefits that are subject to the financial requirement or QTL. That is slightly different than the metric we were using before. So the plan has to recalculate the percentages of expected plan costs only for benefits for which coinsurance applies. You can see that in the second green column circled in red, the numbers have changed slightly. The benefits for which coinsurance and the deductible did not apply no longer go into the total percentage of plan costs. You can see that outpatient preventative and other facility have been stricken from the total because they were either paid at 100% or had a copay, not coinsurance. As a result, all of the other numbers increase slightly because they still need to total up to 100%. These are the percentages that the plan will work with as it continues step two of the test. You can see here that the plan is aggregating the expected plan costs for benefits that have the same coinsurance level. For example, lab and x-ray both require 20% coinsurance and together those benefits account for 38.5% of expected plan costs for benefits where coinsurance applies. 
the plan also has aggregated the expected costs at the other coinsurance levels. But you may note that no one coinsurance level makes up more than half of the expected plan costs. If no single level applies to more than half of the med surge benefits that are subject to this financial requirement, the plan combines levels until the combination applies to more than half of the med surge benefits. And we'll see them do that on the following slide. Beginning with the most restrictive or least generous level of cost sharing, the plan aggregates levels until it exceeds 50% of projected plan costs. We see that combining the 50% coinsurance level and the 30% coinsurance level benefits is only about 24% of projected plan costs. But adding the 25% level coinsurance benefits to those brings us over 50% projected plan costs. The plan now has a combination of coinsurance levels that exceeds 50% of projected plan costs. But which of the coinsurance levels within the combination is considered the predominant level? The least restrictive or most generous level of cost sharing within the combination is considered the predominant level. In this example, that is the 25% coinsurance level. This fictional health plan may require 25% coinsurance for MHSUD benefits in the outpatient all other services classification. This is the maximum MHSUD benefit cost share in this classification. But note that the X-ray and labs med surge benefits in this classification only require 20% coinsurance. Because of the results of this test, the plan could require 25% coinsurance for MHSUD benefits even though some med surge benefits in this classification only require 20% coinsurance. So let's summarize what we saw in this example. In our example, the plan determined that the deductible and coinsurance applied to more than two thirds of med surge benefits, but copays applied to less than two thirds of med surge benefits. So the deductible and coinsurance can apply to MHSUD, but copays may not. The plan then determined that it could apply up to a 25% coinsurance to MHSUD benefits because that was the amount that applied to more than half of the med surge benefits in this classification. And we also saw that there were some med surge benefits that might still have a lower coinsurance than MHSUD benefits in this classification. That brings us to the end of our example and the presentation. Uh, so we'll be happy to go back through any questions that you have. Lynette, did we have anything come in that we need to go over? No, there were not any questions that I saw come up in the chat. All right, well then if anyone would like to chime in um, on the line to ask any questions, be happy to try and answer them. While people are thinking of their questions, I'll just kind of highlight. I know that was that was very technical and it was a lot. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot to digest. Um, first of all, I think Mary did a phenomenal job and it is a very technical um, process and it's it's um, uh, not not straightforward to get through by any stretch. Uh, and it's kind of hard to to whittle this down into something that the general public can can understand so but I, I feel like this information is really valuable not just for committee members but um, but maybe something that the general public would probably benefit from understanding as well um, so I, I don't know I, I would also be interested I mean obviously we want to hear any questions um, I would also be interested in hearing from the health plans on the call uh, Aaron is this a um, presentation is going to be available or something that it would be very handy going forward if perhaps we could get a copy of it. Yeah. I can, I can definitely email a, a copy out with the brochure <laughs> and we can also um, check and see we can post a link also to the website. Well, this presentation is part of the recording for today's meeting, so it'll be on our website, but we can we can also discuss whether or not we could carve it out somehow and make it a standalone. 
uh, recording. Maybe we can see if uh, Amanda can do that for us. Yep. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah. That really yeah. Would. Did you did you like it? I, Mary did a ter terrific job. I think that, you know she really did. It's a great presentation. No, no question. Right. I, My head is spinning though. I, that's the thing. Yeah. It is it's, so very, it's very dense. It's very dense. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. I, I mean, it was absolutely great. But but again, this this is was technical, but incredible information. Thank you. Mary, there are quite a few comments asking to carve this just this portion out as a separate link. And so I'll work with um, Amanda to see if we can do our regular post and then this carve out. And I will keep everyone posted that. Sure. Just a quick comment um is the the thought of implementing this in a big way seems daunting <laughs> i mean it, 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 and also lends itself to a lot of interpretations and i you know i mean it, again a great presentation but boy i'll tell you it's uh it's complicated yeah it, it is unfortunate um it's almost necessary to get this deep into the weeds to sort of understand how you can actually get to the the place where, oh, it is sometimes going to happen that it's okay for yeah. um, them to charge more for, for MHSUD than MedSurge. Um, Dr. Fowles, if you are asking about implementation, you know, at the health plan level, um, or I don't know if you were asking about sort of how the department checks on compliance with this, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, Fortunately, we have a, a pretty robust um, tool that's made available to us by um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that allows us to check a lot of this in an automated way for many of our plans. Um, and then what we what we end up doing is if we receive any errors from that automated tool, uh, the plan gets an opportunity to demonstrate to us um, but essentially what they do is they send me a spreadsheet that looks like all of those example columns that I had, um, and I'm able to walk through the spreadsheet and see that they are applying the test correctly. Good. That's good. Uh, automation really helps here. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and I see a comment or a, a typed comment from Vista to me specifically. So she is trapped on the attendee list. Um, I have been unable to unmute her or make her a panelist, but she says she has some comments and Vista. I am so sorry. I just have not been able to figure out. This is some sort of Webex um, bug. Black hole that you've entered where we can't get you to be allowed to speak. I think um, David Carnahan is in the same places vista they're together <laughs> they're in oh i can hole. i can make him a panelist it's it's okay. only here i just made him a panelist but awesome. uh, it's only vista vista is the only one where make panelist is grayed out and i have been searching webex while you were talking at the beginning of the of the meeting trying to figure out how to get her in and i just can't do it I, maybe yeah it, there should be an orange bar somewhere that allows you to allow the person to come in I yeah. just discovered it in our earlier meeting from this morning. <laughs> yeah, so. it's just um, so apparently she's having trouble with WebEx at her computer. And if she if you and I found a, a WebEx bug online that says if you join WebEx a certain way, you cannot be made a pan panelist. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but she did just send me a comment. So let me see if I can just read it for you. Um, she says she wanted to note that this same analysis has to be done separately for each classification. And the bucket of claims that you use for the analysis must be done by line of business or for a large group. It must be based on its own claims experience. Thank you, Vista. That's very, very helpful to contextualize for everyone to know just the complexity of, of this, the testing that the plans are doing um, to comply with this. And, and this is really just a piece of. Uh, the work that the plans have to do uh, to demonstrate compliance. And it's just a piece of what the department looks at uh, in its analysis of MAPIA compliance. I, well, I just, it does look like we have a few other comments from people with suggestions about, I don't know if it's sharing this with other groups. Right. Um, Carrie is thinking about community 
family run organizations, NAMI, the Involvement Center, sharing this information, um, PowerPoint, other than just the website. And so um, we possibly could take the show on the road as well as with the um, brochure. So that's something that Mary and I can discuss to see if we can, how we can do that. Or even showing this as a, a ongoing webinar training and sharing this recording with other agencies as, as you mentioned, Carrie, NAMI and community family run organizations and things like that. I think for um, family run and customers, this would probably have to be revised a little because it is very technical, it's very high level, and we'd have to put it in a context so they can understand it as well. So I don't want us to present this to like a NAMI organization and they just kind of give us the deer in the head life look because it's it's very complex. And so maybe revising it a little bit so it, it's at a, a different level. That makes sense. I just think of, I think those are often where families will go to for mm -hmm. support that, you know, when, when someone's struggling, so it seems like if they were equipped with that information to help families navigate that that may be um, just a step closer to getting the right information to the right folks that need it. Um, that, that was the thinking. Thank you. Absolutely. I agree. I just want to say, Mary, I think you did such a great job and uh, I think you're on the right track with um, demystifying parity. This was really challenging to try to tackle even just this one small piece of this big broader puzzle, but I really, really loved the presentation um, and maybe there's also a way to do it in a video style. Um, like an animated type video style. I've seen some of the agencies do some work like that before. Uh, that might be another uh, opportunity, but I, I really applaud the department for this. This is uh, very, very helpful. This is Dave Carney, and I'd just like to add as well, I thought it was a great presentation, Mary, and it really gives you some insight into how the determinations are made in terms of the uh, the co-pays and things like that. I, I, frankly, I think this would be a great presentation to physicians and to uh, UR departments to really understand how that works. So uh, thank you for this. It's a great resource. Thank you. I'm this glad to hear Vista. it. Can you, can Vista, you we can now? hear you. Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to echo the comments. It is so complicated and you did a brilliant job of explaining it. Um, but I think it also helps people understand how there can be anomalous results. It comes up a lot in the copay world where when you're doing that same analysis and your higher copay is your predominant level because it's specialist, because a lot of times specialists are more expensive. You can impose that higher copay on behavioral health substance use disorder providers in that classification. Um, and nobody understands why could that copay be higher? A plan could elect to make it lower, but we did have a benefit plan where that was the outcome. Um, and we, we elected to make the copay lower, even though we could have gone higher based on the analysis you just illustrated. Thank you, Vista. That's very helpful. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is just a great presentation. I wonder if the committee has any suggestions for how we, you know, we've talked about obviously putting this on our website. We've talked about uh, getting a, a I, I'm not sure if we have the technology to do a, an animated version of this, but, but uh, I, I feel like there's a way to maybe if we are able to create a, a standalone version of this somehow, how could we disseminate it? How could we get it out to NAMI or to providers or utilization review agents or other organizations? How would the committee, any suggestions from the committee on how we might do that? I mean, I don't know all of these organizations, but I sit on the board for Mental Health America of Arizona and you know, Dawn is obviously part of the psych society. So I think as individual board members, we can, you know, if we're given the 
the tool, we can send it out to our networks. I agree with Carly. I think uh, getting it to the committee members alone might be helpful with they can go to their respective organizations and take it there. And even if you hosted, because I agree, I think we all all have contacts at all those different organizations. And even if perhaps you hosted a webinar, um, and we would be able to help disseminate the uh, webinar invitation to some of those key groups, because that way too, they could ask questions as opposed to just providing a link of a recording. Um, if we can train the trainer kind of a model. And and really reach those big groups like MHA and NAMI and others, then they can respond to questions that they get directly in the community. So I think that that's a key constituency group. That's a great idea, Monica. The WebEx, perhaps. Thank you. I, I guess to that point, perhaps down the line when some of these other things are um are in place and approved like the rules and such maybe there is an opportunity to do a community um training type of event where we can promote this to some of these community organizations so that they have a better holistic understanding of parity i know that um from a high level MHA and, and I'm sure some of these other organizations have, you know, done um, a little bit of education on parity, but if if getting a little bit more into the weeds um, like this portion um, and then maybe in other areas as we continue to kind of iron out the uh, areas of immense confusion over this conversation. That's a great idea. I like it. I, what I heard you say, Carly, is that maybe some kind of a, for lack of a better term, I'll call it a community event, probably virtual still, um, yeah. where, where we could give a presentation like this possibly to kind of help dispel some myths maybe, um, talk about the rules, talk about perhaps, and I think we talked about this maybe at the last meeting or the meeting before um, when we were discussing the idea of Dr. Hennigan going out and giving some presentations, talking also about healthcare appeals and complaints and when you do which and how. So there's, there's a lot that we could talk about. Absolutely. I think this is really great and it fits in the context of this particular committee because you know, we're a little bit more well versed in parity, but I think on its own, there would probably need to be bookends on, you know, what is parity for other organizations because they're not necessarily as, as well, not that I'm claiming that we're all super well educated on parity, <laughs> but we at least have <laughs> a baseline knowledge. It could almost be like a town hall series that we do ongoing. And so we start with what is parity and then everyone, the next one builds upon the previous one. And so um, it's an ongoing series that happens year round. And then obviously we, as things change and update, we modify it to be the most current information possible. But I know Absolutely. that other priorities yeah. for, you know, the immediate moment. So I'm not take it saying take the show on the road tomorrow, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. This would be great to have a podcast centered on this. Uh, more bite sizable information can be disseminated. Uh, you know, put it in three or four podcasts uh, so people can get through it at different times. I think it really helps people to process really a, a complex topic here. How do we make it simpler and more uh, engageable, if you will? I like that idea too. Again, I don't know if we have the technology, but if somebody wanted to establish a podcast and invite us 
<laughs> Would be the world's most boring podcast about insurance. <laughs> sort of fall under the category of a TED talk, maybe. You know, really, that's what I think. We could yeah. definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah. We're finding out too. Providers do better with new information if you break it into smaller pieces. Yeah, absolutely. So do non-providers. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, Don. <laughs> <laughs> These are all great ideas. Any other comments, questions? Mary, thank you. It was awesome. Absolutely. I get that and, part of my brain back now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as we update with site, we splice it, we send it out. You guys will be in, um, in the know of getting the information and what we have for now before we expand out into our TED Talks and podcasts and all of our other um, you know, videos with avatars and things like that. <laughs> I'll keep you posted on the small stuff we can do in, in, at the moment. So thank you for all your feedback. Um, we have some exciting news. Is Mary Kay still on? Is she still with us? I'm here. All right. We have some exciting news and updates about the rules. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary Kaczynski so she can take it away. Thank you, Dr. Hannigan. Um, yes, um, we do have some exciting news. Um, we are very close to uh, having a proposed rule package available for review. Uh, I did send one out yesterday to um, Aaron and Mary Boatwright and Dr. Hannigan. And uh, I think that it, it is still not in a finalized form, but um, it is, I think, pretty close. Uh, we The effort that we made this time was to try to adhere as closely as possible to the language of the Arizona statute so that, you know, um, there isn't going to be a lot of room to criticize um, the department for kind of, you know, getting a little bit too creative. So, um, we made an effort to try and stay, you know, consciously within the statutory language. So, I think we're pretty close. Um, I'll let uh, Aaron talk about um, what our plan is with regard to that and uh, and happy to take any questions um, if anyone has any questions about that. Thank you, Mary. So, yes, um, I, I our, our hope is that we so here's the plan before we actually publish the proposed rule with the secretary of state. We're going to have another listening session and we're going to release a draft of the rule. Uh, and uh, then we'll hold a listening session so people can give us verbal comments and we'll have a, a very short window to receive written comments on that draft. Um, I think if, if, if all goes well, we should have that draft out for folks to look at uh, the first week of November and we should have a listening session scheduled hopefully by the second week of November. Uh, and then you'll have a very short window to give written comments on that draft. Um, the department will then review that those those comments on the draft, and then we'll finalize the rule for publication with the secretary of state. Um, the, as everybody is painfully aware, the um, you know the the second version of the rule has taken some time. So we now that we have some momentum, we really want to keep it going. Uh, hence the short time for written comments on the draft. Um, once we publish with the secretary of state. There's a clock that starts there and everything is very formalized. Um, so we want to try to get the, the uh, version of the rule that gets published at the Secretary of State um, as ironed out as possible. Um, but again, that's why we're giving you such a short time for written comments on the draft. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. Uh, you should be looking at a document, uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. And the only thing I would ask uh, and add to that, Erin, is that the listening session, we plan on having it both uh, insurers and providers. It will be everybody. Yes, we're going to have one. One big, happy, 
listening session. Yes. Any questions? I know you're all very excited to get the rule and to, to have a have a look at it. So we, we should have something to you really soon. So we're very, very pleased to be where we're at. That's really good. Aaron, I'm sorry, my computer blipped out. What's the time frame for the written comments? Um, I think so. If we have if we have the listening session the second week in November, I think the written comments are going to be no later than the end of November. Great. Thank you. Yep. And then you'll have further opportunity to comment once the rules are published, of course. But again, the idea is that the more comments we can get on this draft before we publish officially. Uh, the more opportunity there is to refine the rule so that hopefully there are fewer changes once the rule is published. All right, back to you, Annette. Okay, any other questions? Yes, no? Okay, any um, future topics for next meeting? Let me ask real quick. As we get ready to close. Also, too, I know our next meeting is close to the holiday. It's scheduled for December 17th. Um, if you're planning on being on vacation or out of town, just let me know ahead of time. If Because if we don't have quorum, then we'll just cancel it. So I'm going to be mindful of everyone's time off. As I know, everyone's itching to get out of town and, and do fun stuff with their families. And so we understand that and want to be mindful of that. If that is happening. Okay, we don't have a need for executive session. So if there's nothing else, we will adjourn. I want to thank everybody as always for your participation and time, especially on a Friday. And I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Someone say thank something. you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Have a nice Bye. week, everybody. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Meet y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye.